And now that the recording is in process, I would like to introduce Dion. She is going to be our tech person and run down a couple of things for us. Okay, thank you. Stacy. you wanna show the next slide for us? Beautiful. Okay, hi everyone. If you have not already heard it at least once or twice today, I'm Dion <laughs> Herman. I'm your tech person for um, this workshop and I am from Congregation Kolami in Vancouver, Washington. And I'm sure you guys have all heard this before, but inevitably every, every workshop, every meeting, someone asks these questions. So we're gonna try and cover them in advance. So uh, you have two options for viewing your screen. You at the top right of your screen, you can pick the viewing options, which is gallery view, which shows all of us or speaker view, which will show whomever is talking. So even if um, I spotlight Stacy and all you're seeing is Stacy and the PowerPoint, and you kind of want to just roam around and see what other people are doing, you can switch it back <laughs> to that gallery view and roam around and see what other people are doing. You, I don't know if you know this, you guys can also put the people you want at the top of your screen. I never knew that before. Just click and drag them. So anyway, little one I learned recently that I, I kind of like every once in a while. Um, so every time you, you need to switch back and forth or you can put it however you want to keep it and there you're good to go. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so with that said, if you have any issues and you need help and things aren't working out or you forgot what I just told you, um, please um, send a message to me in the chat, Tech Dion. I put the tech first because my name's so long, you won't see it after. And let me know that you need um, some help and try not to put it to everyone because that distracts from Stacy's beautiful and lovely presentation. And there you go, uh, that's it for me and on to you, Naomi. Thank you so much. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stacey Nagel. Uh, she currently serves as the Vice President of Membership for Pacific District. She is also a treasurer for Miriam Circle Sisterhood in Orange County, California, and a brand new member of Temple Sinai Sisterhood in Las Vegas. Her past board positions in Sisterhood include President, Vice President of Membership and Vice President of Fundraising. Stacy attended the University of California, Davis, as an undergraduate receiving her Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology with a minor in Education. She then attended graduate school at UC Irvine where she received her doctoral degree in social, social ecology with an emphasis in human development. 23 years ago, after the birth of her second daughter, Stacy made the life-changing decision to become a stay-at-home mother and quit her tenure-track position as Cal State San Bernardino. Since then, she rarely has stayed at home, having served as a Girl Scout leader and school volunteer for 18 years. Stacy currently works at home as a business administrator for a computer engineering firm owned by her and her husband of almost 36 years, Mark. Her eldest daughter, Emily, works in the hospitality industry in Nevada, and her youngest daughter, Jenny, is in Chicago, obtaining her master's degree in elementary education at Northwestern University. She loves iced tea macchiato, I'm sorry, iced caramel macchiatos, jigsaw puzzles, and cooking competition TV shows. Her happy place is all three of these at the same time. Stacey. Thank you very much, Naomi, and thank you, Dion. Thank you both for being here today. Um, so the first thing I wanna say is you're probably wondering, well, why is the VP of membership for the district talking about fundraising? And um, I'm going to be talking to you today about why membership and fundraising are intimately tied together and why you can't separate the two. And that's why it's called How to Fundraise Without Losing Members in a Post-Vaccine World. It was called a post-COVID world, but for obvious reasons, I decided it might be more appropriate to call it a post-vaccine world. So the first thing I wanna tell you is what our menu is for today, what we're gonna be discussing. First, I'm gonna talk about why fundraising is important for sisterhoods. Then I'm gonna talk about how we can fundraise without losing our members. And I'm gonna describe for you eight keys to what I think are um, successful fundraisers, regardless of whether it's for a sisterhood, a women's group, or any other organization. I think these keys work for any kind of fundraiser. And then we're gonna talk about how you can prepare to fundraise. And finally, we'll talk about a host of fundraising ideas and I'll answer any and all questions that you may have. Get my finger on the slide there. So first let's talk about why fundraising is important for sisterhoods and for women's groups. 
Sisterhoods may fundraise for a variety of different reasons. They may fundraise to support the congregation. They may fundraise to support their own programming, uh, whether it be um, leadership uh, development, like going to a convention, a WRA Day convention or area event, or to uh, promote their own programs just within their synagogue. They might fundraise to promote temple um, youth programming to support their religious school or their preschool or their college students. They might fundraise to support social action projects or social justice initiatives. They might fundraise to support the WRJ's YES Fund. If you went to the lunch, you know that stands for Youth Education and Special Projects. And hopefully you've heard more about that at lunch today. If you want more information on the YES Fund and how you might fundraise for the YES Fund, we can definitely talk about that or you can contact me for more info. Now, during this past COVID-filled year, for many sisterhoods, fundraising became much more difficult, became much more scattered, and in some cases, non-existent. Even collecting membership dues may have been a struggle or something your sisterhood or women's group even chose not to do. It's very hard to ask folks for money when they're worried about becoming ill, when they're losing their job, when they feel socially isolated, when they may not be seeing you or your community other than on a computer screen occasionally during a Zoom call. So as we start to tiptoe back into our lives prior to coronavirus, and as we try to figure out what our new normal will look like, I think it's very important, and I think this is important both as a VP of membership and as a once upon a time sisterhood VP of fundraising, that we remain keenly aware of how fundraising is intimately tied to membership. We don't wanna fundraise and endanger ourselves in terms of losing members. Should we be fundraising? Yes, of course, our survivals as sisterhoods and women's groups depend on it. But we also should be thinking critically and cautiously as we fundraise, these next few years especially. Membership can and should be our top priority in our sisterhoods. Let's just say it out loud, without members, it's kind of difficult to keep the lights on in a building. So the people have to come before the building, before the lights, the people have to come first and foremost. We still need to keep those lights on, which is why we're here today, but we have to remember that membership has to come first. So how can we fundraise without losing members in a post COVID world? And I'd like to read this quote to you from a very famous philosopher, Socrates. The way to gain a good reputation is to endeavor to be what you desire to appear. What did Socrates mean by this? He meant that if you wanna achieve something, you first have to identify your goal and work hard toward it. You're the ambassador for your dreams. You can be your authentic self and reach your goals. So as we discuss fundraising today, we're gonna to keep in mind that in order to achieve our fundraising goals and maintain our good reputations with our sisters and our congregants, we need to identify our fundraising goal, work hard toward, toward it, and be our authentic selves while we conduct our fundraisers. In order to fundraise without losing our members, we need to keep in mind some important key ingredients that I think, again, apply to every single fundraiser. So here come the ingredients. And I'm gonna show these ingredients all on one slide, but we're gonna go take some time to go through each of the ingredients. So never fear if you don't get it all on this slide. S for safe. Our fundraisers need to be safe for our members and our congregants. O. Our fundraisers need to be at an opportune time. C, our fundraisers need to be connected to our membership. That is, we need to make sure that our members feel connected before we ask them for money. R, we need to be respectful of our members and our donors while we're conducting our fundraisers. You're probably catching on to something. I can't trick you. A, our fundraiser needs to be, our fundraisers need to be aligned with our mission statement, our sisterhood's goals, our sisterhood's budget. T, our fundraisers need to be transparent. We need to be transparent with those that are donating and those that are volunteering as to what we're doing with the money. E, our fundraisers need to be effective. And S, we need to be sincere. And if we can follow these eight keys, we're gonna make lots of money. So let's talk about each of these key ingredients, each of these key keys, um, one at a time. Let's start with safe. 
So if you've been vaccinated, it feels like anyway, that you can go out and about a little bit more at will. But what if you're still cautious? What if you're not vaccinated because you have severe allergies? What if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, you're just not ready for hugs or to be actively engaged? Our sisters are going to have varying degrees of feeling comfortable and safe. You may be okay with getting back to the hugs and meeting in person without masks, they may not. You may not be comfortable with that, they may be. Part of our new normal is making sure that we respect these differences and that we keep in mind that each of us is gonna have a different degree of concern over our current situation. Did you have sisters that attended virtually programs, events, meetings, fundraisers this past year that you've rarely seen in person? If you want to keep those particular members, you have to make sure that you're keeping them safe, that you make them feel safe. So when you're planning your fundraiser for, for the next year or so, aim for a variety, in-person, virtual, hybrid, and what I call mix it up. Mix it up is where you're going to have a variety of different kinds of things, whether it be in-person or virtual or hybrid, depending on the time of year and time of day. If it's winter, and it's a place where it's colder, like the Pacific Northwest, and it's nighttime, that might be a virtual event. If it's spring and the weekend and you can have something outside, in person might work. Have alternatives for those who feel more cautious. Live stream, set up a lap laptop for them to be there. If you're having a fundraiser where you're having some kind of opportunity drawing, make it that winners do not need to be present to win. Keep the safety and security of your community in mind as you plan your fundraisers. For ex another example, if you're gonna have food, serve individual goodies in little bags, or have a buffet where there's individual items where people can take just the individual item, or people are serving other people, not where everybody's scooping out of the same bowl. Little things like that can help your fundraising donors feel more safe, and you'll get more money that way if they feel safe. O is for opportune. I said, how are you, how are you doing? That's because I'm a big fan of friends. And like Joey, I think it's really important to check in on folks. He checked in on women for a different reason. We're checking in on our sister's lives. If someone has just had a death in their family, if they've lost their job, if they're struggling, that's not an opportune time to be asking them to give you funds. So know who your sisters are and check in on them before you're asking them for money. Also, watch out for holidays. If it's Hanukkah and, or Christmas, the high holy days, people may be inundated with the ask. Other organizations may be asking them for money. Those times may not be the most opportune times to be asking your folks for funds. But on the flip side of that, don't let too much time pass between when you advertise your fundraiser and when you ask. A lot of people will forget and move on, so plan your fundraising calendar accordingly. One example might be you're going to have a winter warm-up in January or February, especially in an area that's colder. Maybe you're going to have a soup making contest or a soup luncheon for a cost. You'll have an opportunity drawing for winter goodies. You'll charge a price. Or you'll do it virtually, where you won't charge for the bowl of soup, but you'll have an opportunity drawing via electronic payments. Make sure that if you advertise your winter warm-up, that you ask for the funds either right then and there or right at your winter warm-up. Don't let people come have their soup and a month later, you're asking, remember the winter warm-up? Make sure it's connected. Again, it's probably something your grandma could have told you, but important. Next up, C is for connected. And this is a pet peeve of mine as a membership person. So we're gonna talk about Bertha. Those of you who went to the leadership development um, workshop, I heard Bertha's name come up. She comes up a lot for me. I use her name a lot. So Bertha's a new member of your sisterhood, and she's received two phone calls this past year. Both of them were asking her for money. She's never heard from your sisterhood other than that. She gets emails, mass emails, but in terms of personal phone calls, welcomes, asking her how she's doing, she's not received those. If your members do not feel connected to you and your sisterhood, they're not going to donate. And in fact, remember the title, you might even lose them as members. It's really important that the fundraising team work in conjunction with the membership team in your, in your women's organizations. Make sure that membership 
or all of you, we're all ambassadors, right, for membership, are checking in on your members, seeing how they are, so that the first phone call Bertha doesn't get, or the only phone calls that your members get, are people asking them for money. That's a sure way to make sure people don't give you money. Also, why do you love your sisterhood? Why do you feel connected to your women's organization? If you can explain to others why you love sisterhood and you can help them see your emotional connection to your sisterhood, that's gonna make them more apt to donate money because they're gonna understand your connection and they're gonna feel that emotion coming from you. They're, if they trust you, if they know you, they're gonna feel connected. Make sure also that people feel wanted and needed. People aren't gonna donate if they don't feel wanted and needed. So ask as many people as possible to be involved in the fundraiser. People are more willing to donate if they're involved, if, they're, if they feel like they're a part. Also, people are gonna donate if they believe in a cause. If they believe it, they will donate. I wanna tell you about one of my favorite movies. It's called Green Card. I don't know if any of you have seen it. In, this, in the movie, um, Andy McDowell plays Bronte. And Bronte works for an organization that gives trees to um, inner cities to for kids. And she wants her friend Lauren's mom to donate her trees. So she keeps pitching, Bronte keeps pitching her organization to Lauren's mom. And Lauren's mom keeps saying, no, or I don't know, I don't think so. George comes in and he plays this beautiful impressionistic piano piece with a poem about how children no longer have trees to play in. Guess what? Bronte gets her trees. Why? Because Lauren's mom now connects emotionally to something she cares about rather than just a pitch for money. So make sure that you have a goal, that you have a purpose and that people believe in your cause. And again, if you love your sisterhood and can express that, that'll be part of that. And finally, part of being connected is showing appreciation and gratitude. Be sure you not only thank your donors, but your committee who's helped you on your fundraiser. Do this frequently and do it both privately and publicly. Make calls, write thank you notes, use union grants, thank volunteers at a sister meeting, acknowledge donors and volunteers in a newsletter, inform donors what was accomplished with their donation, hang a plaque that has the name of donors, present small gifts, have a thank you luncheon or reception for your donors. Show your appreciation to your donors and your fundraising volunteers, and they're more likely to help you again, and they're more likely to give you money again. The R in our keys is for respectful. There are a few don'ts of fundraising, a few ways we show disrespect for our donors. One thing we do is we ask them over and over again. If you've asked for a particular fundraiser and you've asked a couple of times and the person has said no, time to move on to somebody else. Don't keep asking over and over again. Maybe another fundraiser later on, you can ask. But this fundraiser, if they've told you how they feel, time to move on. Also, don't ask at the last minute. It's really disrespectful to say, we need the money tomorrow. Can you give us you know, $1,500? Not gonna happen as easily. Also, set an example. If you want people to contribute to something, you have to show that you're willing to contribute to it. So make your contribution before everyone else. It's kind of like if an actor says he doesn't eat something that he's selling, people are less likely to buy it if the actor says, I don't eat hot dogs, but buy my hot dogs, not gonna happen. So you have to make sure that you are setting an example by contributing to the fundraiser yourself. Doesn't have to be a lot, but just showing a sign of support for your own fundraiser. If you're asking for a significant gift, especially, make sure that you ask face-to-face. Face-to-face -face is the best way to ask. Now, if you can't, especially in our current situation, at least by phone or by FaceTime, an email is probably your last way of asking. And especially try not to ask in a mass email. People really like that personal touch, especially again, if it's a significant gift that you want from somebody. Make sure you add that personal touch. Also, listen to your sister's opinions and include them in. Listening is a sign of respect. Don't try to talk people into saying yes to donate. Rather, try and eliminate their reasons for saying no. Listen to their objections and really listen. And then explain to them why you think maybe those objections aren't quite the objections they think they are. I think somebody once said to me, 
it's easier to say to somebody, why haven't you donated? Than to say, why aren't you donating? There's a difference. Meet your donor's need for information and reassurance. Make sure that they are reassured how you're gonna use the money. And we're gonna talk about a little bit more when we get to the next keys. And finally, acknowledge prior gifts when asking again. Don't forget what they gave. Keep records, have someone keep a record. And this goes for volunteering too. There's nothing like volunteering for something and then having somebody say, we've never had a volunteer for that. And the person who volunteered for it is sitting there going, hello. So make sure you keep records of your volunteers and who gave you prior gifts so you can thank them and acknowledge that. Our next key to successful fundraisers. Oh, by the way, those are the children playing in the trees. Don't you feel like giving now? See those cute children playing in the trees? Our next key is make sure that your fundraiser is aligned. Does your sisterhood have a mission statement? Do, do your fundraising projects go along with your mission statement? If you don't have a mission statement, let me know. Put your name and email in the chat and I can send you a sample of mission statements that I know of from my sisterhoods. It's really important that your fundraising projects reflect your mission statement and your sisterhood's goals. If your mission statement is all about the youth at your temple and you're constantly helping the doggies by making doggy treats, it's wonderful to help the doggies. But anybody looking at that is going to say, you're not really doing what your mission statement says you're, you plan on doing. So make sure that your fundraisers are aligned with your mission statement. Also, people like to give to organizations that have a specific purpose for their fundraising activity. The very first question to ask yourself when you're gonna do a fundraiser is why? What do we need this money for? Why are we doing this fundraiser? What's our purpose? If you know your purpose, you can explain to others. People really like to know why you're doing your fundraiser. And make sure then that your fundraiser is aligned with that purpose. Finally, does your fundraiser fit in with your operating budget? Is it aligned with your operating budget? You do need to have a budget and you do need to make sure that your fundraising is in that budget. Sometimes people forget that in order to make money, you have to spend money. So make sure that you include in your budget fund any fundraising costs that might come along. And we're gonna discuss those costs a little bit more when we discuss how to prepare your fundraisers. Another pet peeve, I have several pet peeves. Another one of mine is being transparent. Make sure that both your donors and your fundraising committee know the purpose and goals of your project and that they can explain it to others. I had something happen to me a while back where I was asked to participate in a celebration of members. And would I be on the committee? And I thought, what a great idea. It's a great time to celebrate our members. I went to the first meeting and found out it was a fundraiser to get money from the members. That's a very different purpose. Anyway, to make sure you're transparent, make sure that what you're saying you're going to do, you do. Have you communicated your why, your purpose, and are you sticking to that purpose? Also, part of transparency is letting people know how much you made at the end. Make sure that you tell people what the results of your fundraiser were and share them. Don't be afraid to share them. You don't have to tell people, by the way, and this goes for your budget too, you don't have to tell people exactly what you're using the money. Um, you don't have to show every single detail of your budget, but have a graph, for example, that says something like 60% of our budget, 60% of our fundraising goes to the youth at our temple, 40% goes to leadership development and our sister programming. Whatever it is that your sisterhood or women's organization does with your money, show it. Again, you can show it in a more broad way, but be transparent about it. Let them know. And our final two keys. Make sure that you're being effective. If you wanna have a successful fundraiser, it has to be an effective fundraiser. Are your fundraising goals realistic and attainable? If you have 50 women in your sisterhood and you're asking 50 women to donate, and you're saying we wanna make $100,000 on a bake sale, and yes, you know I'm exaggerating, but you can see that's not going to be a realistic attainable goal. Are you trying new ideas? A lot of times the most successful fundraisers come from new members or new people to your fundraising team. Listen to their ideas, try them out. You have nothing to lose. If it didn't work, you can revamp it or you can try it a different way or not do it again. 
but make sure that you're listening to new ideas and trying them out. Again, new twists on old ideas also work really well. That's a great way to be effective is to try something new, something you haven't tried before. People might really love that and might donate more. Publicity is the main key to fundraising. You have to have exciting and inviting publicity. First thing people are going to see are your flyers, your announcements, your when you make your phone call, your script. So make sure the way you're advertising is exciting and inviting. Is the leader of your fundraising activity someone who's effective? Is it somebody who has the ability to see a project through to completion and understands the bigger picture and understands the why behind your fundraising? Make sure you choose a chair who's an effective leader. And Finally, for being effective, make sure you keep records and evaluate your fundraiser afterwards. Document and evaluate what worked well, what didn't work as well, what can we improve on so that we can possibly make more money next time. Last but not least, the last S in Socrates, sincere. I have why do you build me up buttercup? People will donate to people they know, trust, and respect. If you kiss up or butter up, not gonna get as much money. People are wise to that. So be truthful and be honest. We need your skills. We need your help. Is much better than you're the best invitation writer in town. You go, you glow, you shine, gal. People are wise to that. Know your facts and tell the truth. Don't exaggerate. If you don't know an answer to a question, don't make it up. And promise only what you can deliver. I'm going to date myself, but I used to be a big fan of the Brady Bunch. And some of you might remember Marsha Brady promised that Davy Jones would come to her school dance. Now, because it was a TV show, it worked out great for Marsha. She met Davy Jones and he came to her school dance. But the reality is that you can't promise that Adam Sandler is going to come to your fundraiser and sing Eight Crazy Nights if it's not going to happen. Don't make promises you can't keep. Only promise what you can deliver. Use the donations for the purpose for which they were collected. We, very long time ago, had somebody who put out a flyer who said all, and the keyword there is all. All proceeds from this fundraiser are gonna go to our synagogue youth. The problem, that wasn't totally true. We were using some of the fundraising for our own sisterhood programming, uh, for our leadership development to go to convention. So to say the word all wasn't 100% true. It's important to be 100% true to your donors. Don't bamboozle people. Don't be secretive. Ask directly for a contribution. Don't hint. It doesn't work. Be your authentic, honest self. People are going to be more likely to donate, again, if they know, trust, and respect you. So where does that leave us? The eight keys to successful fundraising. Safe, opportune, Connected, respectful, aligned, transparent, effective, and sincere. And that's the way you make the money. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to take this and talk about how you can prepare to fundraise, keeping in mind those eight keys the entire time. We're gonna talk mostly about advertising because that is the most important key, the most important part of preparing to fundraise but you also need to think about your budget, your timeline. Do you need volunteers? If it's someplace out, out and about, do you have the location? Are you having a speaker? Do you have an agenda for the event? Have you thanked your volunteers and donors? And have you evaluated the fundraiser afterwards? So let's take these a little bit at a time. Let's talk about advertising. Make sure that you design a flyer or an invitation for the event, which includes the following a description of the program or the fundraiser, the date, the time, the place, the cost, who to RSVP to and what's the RSVP cutoff date. Are you gonna have babysitting? Are you gonna have transportation? Remember to always answer the five W's in your information. Who, what, where, when, and why. Allow enough time before the event for printing or copying and addressing mailing if you're using snail mail your flyers to go out. I usually like to leave at least four to five weeks prior. Some people like to leave even six weeks, seven weeks prior to make sure that you can get those out in a timely manner. 
If you're emailing, if you're going to use email, because a lot of times that's easier these days, you're going to use an evite. Make sure you present that email or evite several times. It's kind of like a kid watching a Barney episode. The Barney episode was like three or four times because people need to see it more than once. Make sure you have an event budget. Fundraising, again, has costs involved. Some of those costs that you might not think of include printing, mailing, postage, advertising. You're going to advertise it, for example, in JLife, speaker, food, decor, entertainment, photography, awards, gifts, maybe transportation, maybe babysitter. After you figure out your costs, estimate the number of attendees you think you might get and how much you'll charge each person based on the type of event, based on the number of attendees, and based on those costs. Always better to overestimate the costs and underestimate the number of attendees. Be a little conservative. Prepare a timeline for all tasks to be completed prior to the event. I like to work backwards, and I usually like to work at least four months prior to the event activity, depending on what it is. If you have to hire somebody and it's a year out, like when you throw your kid a um, bar bat mitzvah, then you might even need to prepare even further, further out. But start backwards and put together a timeline. Ask volunteers what they like to do. I do not like to be voluntold. I like to be asked, what do you like to do? You could even say, for this, for this fundraiser, we have all different kinds of things. Here's a list of the, the kinds of things we have. Do any of these look good to you? Would you like to do any of them? Allowing folks to choose how they want to help will make them want to help more. Also, allow them to volunteer for as much or little time as they like. A 10-minute volunteer is just as vital as a 10-hour or 10-day or 10-month volunteer. Make any necessary arrangements with your guest speakers. If you need any equipment, make that uh, get your equipment set, settled in advance. And get contact information for your speaker. Make sure you have that in advance. A few days before, contact them and confirm, and the day of. Need a synagogue or location space for your fundraiser? Confirm the tables, the chairs, the arrangements. And again, confirm a couple weeks before and the day before. Plan an agenda for an event if it's an event that's a big fundraiser. Make sure you have an agenda for how the fundraiser is going to go, who's going to speak, how are they going to speak. And one thing that I wanted to um, mention is that sometimes it's good if you're going to have someone tell an emotional story, let the people tell the emotional story and then let, let someone else do the asking for the fundraiser. There's nothing as awkward as having a wonderful couple get up and say how much the sisterhood has helped their family and what they've done for them, and then turn around and say, now will you please give us money? It feels awkward. So let let's the, your speaker, your guest woman, your guest couple, your guest kids talk, and then have someone else, your president, your vice president of, of fundraising, someone else do the actual ask. People will feel emotional and welled up. And then you'll say, thank you so much for that story. That was an amazing story. You can see how much sisterhood has helped. And then you do the ask. Don't have it be the same person who did the, who did the emotional spiel. Remind people on the agenda of their roles. Remind them what they decided they wanted to take on and remind them several times throughout the fundraising pr preparations. Make personal calls to those donors who you think might attend. Again, especially I'm just going to say it. We all have heavy hitters in our synagogues and in our sisterhood, people who are very generous. If you want those people to attend, if you want them to donate, make sure you're making it personal. Make sure you're calling them, talking to them, telling them you really would love to have them there. Write thank you notes to your speakers, to your hostesses, to anybody involved in the event. And write thank you notes to your donors, reminding them how your women's organization is going to utilize the funds and how much those funds are appreciated. And finally, evaluate the event. Have a post fundraiser meeting. What went well? What didn't go so well? What can we do to improve next time? I gotta get, sorry, I lost my place. My notes. There we go. So now, what I'd like to do next is take those eight keys to a successful fundraiser and tell you how they might fit with a couple of examples. And then we'll talk about a whole bunch of different things. So 
the first one I want to talk about is called Count Your Blessings. Count Your Blessings is a virtual fundraiser, which makes it lovely, especially with, in light of our current situation, where you ask folks to count their blessings and donate, let's say, $1 for each blessing. The blessings on a flyer can include things like having a roof over their head, having a job, having a partner, having kids, grandkids, pets, being a part of sisterhood, being a part of WRJ, uh, being, being a part of the world, having nature outside. It can be anything you want. And you ask them to add up all their dollars, all their check marks, and donate that money to your women's organization. Now, you could do this along with a virtual tea. You could have attach a tea bag to the flyer, and then you have everybody drink a cup of tea together at a certain time on Zoom. This is a way to ask for funds without having to ask your donors to attend an event. So in terms of safety, it's really safe because everybody is gonna be online or everybody's gonna be doing it from the comfort of their own home. If you do this around Mother's Day, for example, or in the spring, that's a really opportune time to do it. You also could do it in winter when people are cold and wanna drink tea, maybe in January or February. Again, a really nice opportune time. High holy, middle of high holy days when people are busy, not such an opportune time. Make sure this isn't the only time that you've connected with your members. Don't start out with, hey, let's send in a dollar for each of our blessings. Make sure that your membership team and that all of you have been ambassadors for your sisterhood, connecting with your members, checking in on them. But if you also combine this with a virtual tea, that's another great way to connect with your members. You're connecting socially while you're also having people give you money. Make sure that you're respectful. If somebody doesn't turn in their flyer, don't keep hounding them with flyers. Don't keep hounding them. Hey, we didn't get your count your blessings. Don't say thank you to the 10 people out of the 15 that gave us their money. And the five of you who didn't, we know who you are. It's, I know it's, you're probably giggling, but I've seen things like that more subtly happen. Be respectful. Make sure that this Count Your Blessings fundraiser is aligned with your mission statement. Is part of your mission statement to be social? Then you could do this virtually and have that tea. That's part of being social. Is part of your mission statement to make sure we're grateful or spiritual and how we think about our lives? You could put that into your flyer. Make sure it's aligned with your operating budget too. Make sure you're transparent on your flyer. Say how you're going to use the funds. Make sure it's effective by making sure you have an effective leader who's in charge of this fundraiser to make sure that you evaluate how it went afterwards and make sure you're sincere. That really goes along with transparency. They're kind of really connected there. Make sure you're not promising things you can't deliver. We're gonna use all this money to fund the religious school's roof. When you're, if you're not gonna use all of it for that reason, don't promise that. One more fundraiser I wanna talk about using these keys and then we'll open it up to a whole bunch of different kinds of fundraisers. It's called Minute Madness. My daughter's theater uh, group did this, and it was really fun. At an event, any kind of event, it could be your membership event, it could be, uh, I don't know if I do it at Sister Chabot, but it could be at any kind of activity or event your sisterhood is having. You set a minute on the clock, and you ask folks to take out some change or dollar bills, anything they have, and you invite volunteers. And by the way, kids are really great for this. People like giving money to kids. Um, teenagers love running around too. Um, and you ask the volunteers to hold baskets and run around for one minute with these baskets. And everyone at the event throws their change and their dollar bills into the baskets while the clock ticks down the minute. And what's wonderful about this is that people seem to like the competition with the clock. People get really excited about beating out the clock. So it kind of takes it off of everything but the clock and everybody's competing against the clock to give money. What's wonderful about it is that you also can be safe if you just have people throwing in their own money, not touching the basket, just have the kids holding it out, they throw it in. It can be opportune as long as you're not doing it, again, right around the high holy days or right around Hanukkah when people are saving their change to give to their kids for Hanukkah. Make sure, again, you're connected to your members before you do something like this. People are much more likely to throw lots of money into that basket if they feel connected to your organization and if they feel connected to you. Make sure you're being respectful. If someone isn't holding out any money, don't stand there with the basket. Make sure you tell your volunteers, let's not stand there and hover over people. If people have money, great. If they don't, that's okay. Again, make sure it's aligned with your mission statement, 
with your budget, with your, your why, why you're having the fundraiser. Make sure you have somebody effective running it and that you evaluate it. And make sure again, that you, when you say what you're using the money for, you're being honest and truthful. People will donate when they trust you and they know you and they respect you. So with that, let's talk about a few other kind of fundraisers. And by the way, I have Yammer in the midst of this diamond, big as I'll get out. That is because Yammer has a fundraising group. And if you wanna join the fundraising group on Yammer, you will find in the files, tons of different kinds of flyers for fundraisers. People have put all different kinds of fundraising ideas on there. They ask about fundraising ideas and then people respond. That fundraising group is phenomenal, especially if you go to the files, you will find lots of different ideas. The other thing I wanted to mention before we talk about a few of these fundraising ideas is that in your virtual gift that you got as part of being a registrant of area event, I included something that a document called 50 fun ways to fundraise. And at the very bottom of that document is my name and email. So if you have any questions about any of those fundraisers, if there's anything that you think, hmm, I might wanna do this and you're not sure, please feel free to ask me and I will be more than happy to tell you about that fundraiser, give you more detail. So I wanna tell you about a couple of fundraisers here. I gotta get to my notes. My notes are not covering, let's see if I can do page down. Okay, so one idea is Deli Day. Deli Day is where you might have somebody, a uh, local um, deli, or somebody who's really good at cooking or a caterer in your sisterhood, uh, make corned beef sandwiches, pastrami sandwiches, you might have some salads like potato salad and coleslaw and pickles, and you sell those and you might deliver them door to door, you might have people pick them up at a particular time at your synagogue, and you sell those for a cost, and people all can even eat that together, maybe it's a Shabbat dinner before Shabbat, you also could sell them to local businesses. Maybe there's a local business complex and you could ask them if they want for lunch one day to have deli and your sisterhood could sell them. Another idea is an antique roadshow. You could hire an appraiser and have members bring their antiques to be appraised and you could charge a fee for each item being appraised. People can attend without items to be appraised just to see the items. And maybe you can serve refreshments at a small fee. So people can pay $5 to get in and see the items. They can pay to have an item appraised. They can pay to have a little bit of refreshment and everybody can have a lovely day with antiques. You also might try a progressive dinner. Um, this is a great social event for both existing and new members. You can recruit, recruit a group of host families to serve different courses of a meal. And members are randomly assigned to a group that moves from home to home throughout the evening. So, and a variation on this, by the way, that might be a little safer right now is to meet at the synagogue, especially if it's a nice day and it's outside and do lunch and have the hors d'oeuvre part of lunch outside of the synagogue. Then maybe you go to someone's backyard and you have the main course of lunch and then you can go back to the synagogue for dessert. What I love about this is it's a small fundraiser, but again, it serves as a, really good way to, for people to connect and socialize. So there are lots of different fundraising ideas out there. I think what I'd like to do now is open it up to your questions or if you have any um, fundraising ideas that you would like to, to talk about. See if there's what's in the chat. Does anybody have any questions or any fundraisers that oh, they particularly here you guys, have? the tech person was talking and she was talking to herself. So now <laughs> I'm talking, but I couldn't see myself, Daisy, because you're spotlighted. So oh. hi, everyone. I was about to say. Yeah, let's do that again. Hi, everybody. That was awesome. Thank you, Stacy. Um, personally, I love the antique roadshow idea. I'm all over that. That was a great one. Um, so we're going to go forward and do some questions here. You can either put your questions in the chat or you can raise your virtual hand and Naomi will get you and have you ask your question to Stacy. There you go. Take it away, Naomi. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I was, I was having <laughs> I was having some internet phasing issues, but we've we've hot spotted and we should be good. Uh, we did hey, not Stacey, have. Any... Why don't we take your PowerPoint down? Yeah, I could do that. I want to show you my last slide though, because I love my last slide. 
I do, because I get to hug you. Um, there's me hugging you. My name and number are on the last slide. And also, if you want to join that Yammer fundraising group, you contact Heather Lorgery at leadership at WRJ.org, and she will get you on Yammer. I tell you, that fundraising group is awesome. That, that is just got packed full of information. And now I will stop sharing my screen so I can see everybody. And I've also and put also Stacy's information in the chat. I don't see anyone's raised hands. And Have you guys ever done a crazy car oh. rally? Anybody ever, you know what a crazy oh. car rally is? What kind of fundraisers have you done or what kind of fundraisers are you looking to do? We did have one question from oh. Natalie. She yeah. asked how we could get slides of the program. Okay, so I will send my slide deck um, to, uh, do I send it to Shoshana Dion? Is that the best person? Yep. I will, send my, I will send my slide deck to Shoshana, but also this is being recorded. So if you want the whole presentation again, it will be on Yammer. Yes. So I can tell you a fundraiser our sister had had that was um, surprisingly, I don't, we didn't mean it to be a fundraiser, but we made money. So it, that's always good, right? So then you can do it again. But we actually wanted to copy how everybody does the, you know, the paint and sips, but the cost of going to a paint and sip place was excessive. So one of our um, sisterhood members had a mother who was an artist and it would cost us much less to, we got, we bought little easels at like Michael's that we still have and everyone paid a small fee. We had people bring drinks and snacks and we actually ended up making money and I could see how that would be a terrific fundraiser and people had a really fun time. And then we kind of had the pictures around the synagogue for a while before people, they were dry. So everybody got to see them all over in the, in the social hall. So that was something that we did that I think could continually be done. It, I know it's been happening for a long time but it kind of never gets old. I love that idea. Absolutely love that. Are a lot of you still doing virtual fundraisers or not very many fundraisers right now as you're kind of tiptoeing back in uh, to our new normal? We've got the high holidays coming up. So nobody wants to get in the way of the asks for the, the appeal. Um, so probably afterwards, but Stacy, I gotta tell you, your presentation was so, I, I just kept writing and writing and writing. <laughs> just and, and so well thought out and presented. It, it just seemed like it was so natural for you to talk about this stuff, which I've heard you do it before. And it is natural for you. You're, you're such a good ambassador for fundraising. Thank you. I love membership those. And I noticed we didn't have really have a membership workshop and we didn't have a fundraising workshop. I thought those two things go together. So that is why I really wanted to make sure um, that we talked about how membership and fundraising are, are related. Please believe me, you will get more money from folks if you are connecting with them and making them feel welcome and appreciated. And so make sure that your members come first. You, if you, Make sure that you've connected with people before you do the ask. I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience, um, and I haven't had it recently, but I have had it in the past, where you get a call from um, a synagogue that's asking you for money, um, and they don't even maybe know that you've been a member for a long time. They don't know you. Um, and again, this hasn't happened to me for a very long time, but um, you, don't, you don't want that to happen because then you're not, you're not as likely to get your money. So um, if you have a membership team, awesome, work with them if you're the fundraiser. Um, if you don't, really everyone should be um, an ambassador for membership. Make sure that, you know, ask people, can you just make five phone calls and just check in? Let's just check in on our sisters. How are they doing? I just that's, said, a, yeah. that's a correction that I just met with my board. Um, what had been happening originally is we sent membership letters out and membership letters were returned to our treasurer first, and then the treasurer would share the information with the president me. So I wasn't typically calling members to thank them for their membership until weeks after they'd written a check and definitely not until the check was cashed. So this year, membership letters will be coming directly to me and I will get them to our treasurer when I get them to the treasurer. Uh, Phyllis was next. 
I was going to say during COVID, we did a fundraiser that was extremely successful. And we might do one again, depending on what happens this year. Uh, we did a virtual talent show. And what we did was we involved the school. We told the kids because they had no way really of meeting and making money and whatever throughout the last year. Um, so we had, um, we have, we're very fortunate to where we have some very professional um, singers and people that were home during a COVID that would have been on Broadway and a couple other, some other things that volunteered, but we would have a person, uh, an adult do some kind of little performance, which they pre-taped a lot of them. And then we would have a child do something. And then we had an adult, then we had a child. So we had these little, we had a two-year-old that did a Michael Jackson dance. And we had a, um, a, a seven-year-old that sang with her mom, which was incredible. And then we opened up our chat box to making online donations. And so after a kid would donate, all of a sudden you saw the chat box just light up. And we made quite a bit of money that we did not expect. We figured make a couple of hundred dollars and we made a few thousand. So it was, it was really fun and very easy to put together. That is an awesome idea. That I love that idea. Have you guys ever heard of a Torathon? I forgot to mention this. You, it's kind of like a theater thon or, or a talent show that you, you see if people can read all, is it 5,845 verses? Have I got that right? Of the Torah in a day. And what you do is it's not one person doing the reading throughout the day. You have people who are Torah readers in the morning and then you have people come, you have shifts and you have pledge, you have pledges kind of like your kids would do with a jog -a -thon or something like that. And people can pledge and you can have um, awards for the religious school class that has the most pledges or um, any family that gets over, you know, hundred dollars worth of pledges. You can have little rewards and um, awards for them. And um, you have people pledge whether it's going to be, you're going to get through half the verses, whether it's going to be, you're going to get through one third, whether, you know, somebody wants to pledge more money, you're going to get through the whole thing. Um, and you can serve refreshments. You can have a little brunch in the morning, breakfast in the morning, and maybe a lunch in the afternoon and um, something, some little dinner. Um, it brings people together and it's religious, which I love, it's spiritual, and um, you make money at the same time. So it's a great combination. I love things like that, Phyllis. I love like virtual talent shows or theater thons or tour thons or things like that where, where you're bringing people together um, as a whole. So what a great idea. I have no clue what time it is because I'm having so much fun. You, <laughs> We've got it 15 is, minutes. Yeah, it's actually uh, 2.13. So we have a few more minutes for questions. Um, I wanted to ask a question, Stacey, if you had any information on combined sisterhood brotherhood fundraisers. At the synagogue I was in New Orleans, I was, um, I was still a little shy, so I didn't see how it worked, but I know that we helped them. Um, do you have any advice on successful events like that? Um, so as part of that preparation for a fundraiser, um, I don't know how to say this nicely, I'll just say it. When you're working with the men folk, um, make sure that the roles of who's doing what are very well delineated. Um, make sure that everybody knows the role they're going to play and make sure that there's an understanding of how the funds are going to be divided. Um, if, if, you're bringing in a speaker, then that speaker could be divided in half in terms of who's paying what. Um, sometimes you will find on the day of that even if you have delineated the roles, um, some folks might forget what their roles were. So maybe you have somebody that is checking back in with the president of your men's group or brotherhood. Um, could you please just make sure that you remind your guys, you know, uh, what their roles are? Um, I love it when the men's group and um, our women's organizations get together because I love it when we can provide a united front, number one. And number two, sometimes you can bring really amazing speakers in that you might not be able to bring in um, solo. Um, but again, you have to be on top of, uh, of things in terms of what role people are playing and make sure that you're checking in with the men's group to make sure they understand their roles and you have to kind of do that all along the way with the fundraiser. Trying to be trying to be polite to the guys here, but that's 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 my take on on joining. But I think it's wonderful. I think if you can do it, if if you have a supportive men's group, especially that wants to do something like that, as long as they understand their role, I think it's awesome. Tracy brought up that her sister those great events with the men's group and that they uh, bartend for bingo night. Um, 
I believe in New Orleans, the uh, men's group was very specifically in charge of the barbecue, um, while Sisterhood did managed other portions of, of events. <laughs> I think those things are wonderful. And a lot of times the men really like to do that. One thing I'm going to suggest, though, is remember that voluntold idea. Make sure you ask them, hey, we would really like to do this. What part would you like to play? It's kind of like when the synagogue, um, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, to you ladies, but when the synagogue asks our, our women's group to do something, but they say it like, we would like you to cook. Instead of saying, hey, we have all these different roles. What would you like to do? Sometimes we want to do RSVPs and registration, right? Sometimes we want to be out there, not in the kitchen. We want to be uh, involved with the kids if it's a kid kind of thing. Um, so I think it's the same thing with our men. I think it's awesome that the men do that and are so supportive of us. And um, if they want to do that, that's awesome. But just make sure, just like we would um, ask anybody else, we're asking them, here are the different assignments. Here are the different things we need. What do you think you would like to do? But then again, make sure that they know they have to follow through um, on that role that they take. So I get the feeling you're talking from experience. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Stacy, um, Women of B'nai Israel for several years did a combined event with, we did a couple of combined events with our brotherhood and you are so right on in terms of explaining not only you know the roles and what's gonna happen with the money, we had a situation where our women pay to come to the event and the brotherhood was coming for free and the women went nuts. And of course the brotherhood got a little bit upset because you know all of a sudden, why should we have to pay? We're working at the event. Well, you know, you're a volunteer. So it was the roles and, and how you play them and how the money is being divided. But the one thing that we didn't do that I think would really be helpful tagging into membership is to remember that when you do a joint event, there should be a pitch for each of the spouses to join the organization and be supportive so we can do bigger, better, more. And I mean, the, the women at B'nai Israel always have way more money than the Brotherhood. They, they have social action. They, the, the men did cooking for bar and bat mitzvahs. Well, you know what happened to that during the COVID. So, um, you know, when you lose a source of revenue, it's really, really important and that stewarding your likely donors is just incredibly important. And I just spent a, two years chairing our local federation campaign. And outreach is so important, not just the people who always get called and ask, make that effort and it's important. So it's member stu membership stewardship. It, it really is intimately tied. And that's why I think some people, you, some of you may have, and I could be talking at a turn here, thought, why is it called fundraising without losing your membership? How would fundraising, how could you lose a member from fundraising if you're not connected, if you're not transparent? I love the idea, Lindy, of making sure that everybody understands it's a, that we're all in this together, that we're trying to fundraise. Let's say you're trying to fundraise for the religious school roof. Um, everybody has the same goal, the same purpose, and that's a part of both your mission statements. So, but also both groups are supportive of the temple. So why not have the spouses, the partners joining? And that's a great, you're right, to, put, to make that plug at the same time. Um, it really is about synergy. Um, and I think that if, you, if you're really honest with your membership, if you're transparent with them, if you're sincere, you're gonna make, you're gonna make money hand over fist. I hope. <laughs> So. Most sisters have dues levels. I, I don't know. Actually, I don't. I, I can tell you from VP of membership, most do that I've that I've seen as a VP of membership. I can't talk for the the ladies here though if they all have uh, different levels of membership. It looked like um, it looked like Norma has a question next. I was going to let you know that I'm Renee from Tucson, Arizona, and we do have membership levels. We have um, several levels. We did uh, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, and Miriam this year. So it started at $40 to Miriam 108, and then we had an other category. So I just wanted to reflect on that. Thank you, Renee. You're welcome. Temple Mount Sinai has a similar, um, a similar uh, structure. We have uh, Miriam is 
I'm the president and I can't remember. I, I have to have my letter in front of me. I know that there's a Ruth, a Miriam, and I believe a Sarah. I think there's another one. <laughs> I think most sisterhoods do do love, not all, but some, yeah. Norma, did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if anybody is planning any sort of um, Hanukkah Bazaar this year, if they're able to do that. <clears throat> We skipped ours last year, obviously. Um, we were put, we were in the midst of putting our gift shop online. Um, <clears throat> so we did the Hanukkah stuff first and we arranged appointments for people to come to order and come pick up their stuff. And then we had one day work for a mass pickup. But um, yeah, so I was wondering, anybody doing any kind of- I say we're doing last year we did a virtual one and it wasn't very successful we had an online bidding and everything it wasn't very successful but this year we already have our date set for our Hanukkah boutique we're doing it outdoors um, in our outside our activity center we're having all the booths set up outside um, there are a couple of booths that we might still do inside but we've already got approval from the temple to do a regular Hanukkah boutique this year and we have so many vendors that are looking to do one because they lost so much income this year they're fighting over who's going to get, who's going to actually come in because that we have too many vendors that wanted to come in. Wow. That's interesting. Um, Beth David's also planning ours um, this year too. It's going to be, we're doing it indoors because we're also doing a carnival if, and we're getting our vendors now too. If yeah. you, if you want to do something on a smaller scale and you want to do, I love the outdoor idea, especially because of our current situation, we never know. Right. Um, one year, our, um, our sisterhood did a Hanukkah basics where we did candles. Um, so people had a, knew they had a place to go. Um, they could go to a table. They didn't have to go, especially with now if they didn't want to go to a store. Um, I, it's harder now. This was years ago because I think you can do these things online, but um, candles, um, I think we had a few menorahs, um, or Hanukkah, uh, dra dreidels, gelt gift wrap cards. We just did the basics and we kind of had like a little, and we made, I think we, we thought we'd make a little bit of money. We made like $750. So. Wow. Yeah, every, so early yeah. this year too, so. I'm sorry, Ruth does have her hand raised. Okay. You know, we did the same, a really similar thing to what you were just talking about, a basics. And we took things from our gift shop, all the candles, and we did it outside and all the tables were, well spaced and we did really really well and we're going to do a similar thing this year hopefully a little more elaborate um not necessarily with outside vendors but um we're also planning to do it outside weather permitting one thing i want to mention that i didn't mention in my presentation um Sometimes it's good to give your members something for free, a little goodie um, that's not fundraising related. Like you give them a, um, I just got a lovely poster um, from my president who's on here, Nancy Fidel, um, that has Miriam Circle's logo on it. I love it. I use it for everything. Um, just as a little gift to your members, when you do that and then you ask them for money later, they're going to remember, oh, that was so sweet that they gave us that little gift. And now they need our help. And here's why they need it, because you're being transparent. Of course, I'll help. Um, it just makes people feel really good. They get a little something. So something to think about. Spend a little to make a little more. So. From the chat, Phyllis did want to share that the, her sister had made several thousand dollars um, each year from their boutique uh, yeah. with about 25 booths. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Anybody else? I think we're almost, is it almost time? We are at the 24 minute mark. Um, that gives everyone a moment to brew another cup of tea, uh, take a bit of break and um, move on to some of our next uh, programs. And I put the closing in the chat for you all a couple of times there and please join us. We have a wonderful music surprise for you. <laughs> I just want to thank you all so much for coming to the presentation today, but also to Area Event. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, and I hope, I just hope you've had a wonderful weekend um, and that you enjoy the closing. And I think there's going to be an evaluation. They'll probably talk about that at closing, but make sure that you fill out that evaluation because that helps us to plan for the next Area Event as well. So thank um, you. Uh, if you need me, I'm around. Um, should I put, is my name and email in the chat? Should I put it? 
It has been shared, but we can share it another time. Right. Yeah, I'll share it. I am. And I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now. Thank you, everyone.